welcome to our midweek Bible study. And this week we're starting a new series called The Power of Forgiveness. And over the next four weeks we'll be looking at uh, the mercy of Jesus Christ on display through several accounts in the Gospels. Uh, these lessons, they highlight the authority of Jesus to forgive, his desire to forgive and not condemn, his command that we forgive others, and the hope that as long as we can have breath, we can find a place of forgiveness. So this series is going to help us activate the power of forgiveness in us and through us. But this week is the first lesson of this new series, and we're doing a topic called the authority to forgive, authority to forgive. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4 to begin. And at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he was led into the spirit, uh, led by the spirit rather, into the wilderness. And there he fasted for 40 days. And afterwards he was hungry and he was tempted by the devil who said things to him like, you know, um, to command these, these stones be made bread. And Jesus countered the temptation of the devil with the word of God. After that, um, John, or around that time, John the Baptist was arrested and put into prison. And this is the time that Jesus began his ministry. After this temptation in the wilderness, after the temptation by the desert, or sorry, the time in the wilderness, and the temptation of the, of the devil, that's when his ministry began. And he moved from Nazareth to a place called Capernaum in Galilee. And he went around Galilee preaching. And you can find that in Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali. And so after moving from Nazareth to Capernaum, Jesus began to, to preach and teach all around Galilee. And this is also the time he began to call his disciples, from most of whom were fishermen, in the Sea of Galilee at that time. And let's turn to the book of Mark chapter 1 and read verse 22. On the very, it says, when they, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So on the very first Sabbath um, after Jesus came to Capernaum, he went into the synagogue and he started teaching them from the scriptures and, and they were amazed at his teaching. He, he taught them like no man had um, taught before. And in fact, they said he, he taught them as one having authority, not like the scribes. And we'll look at the, who the scribes were shortly. So he took four of his disciples into the Sabbath, Peter, Andrew, James and John. And his teaching astonished the congregation. And they never heard anyone teach like him before. But suddenly... As he was teaching, Jesus was interrupted. So in verse 23 of Mark 1, it says, There was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Leave us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So this man was, had an unclean spirit, and this spirit recognized who Jesus was, the Holy One of God, and began to, to, to interrupt his teaching and saying, What are you doing here? Have you come to destroy us? Well, Jesus rebuked him and said, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Verse 27. Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What's this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And verse 28 says, Immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. So he was new in town into this town of Capernaum. And though he began to preach around Galilee, he went into the synagogue in Capernaum and began to teach. And though he was interrupted by a man with an unclean spirit who Jesus immediately commanded to leave the man. And everyone's astonished. They hadn't heard anyone speak like this before and to have authority to actually command the spirit out of this man. This is not something they'd ever seen. After that, Jesus gave them even more to talk about. When they left um, the synagogue. They went to um, Peter's um, house where they found Peter's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and Jesus just healed her with a simple touch. And of course this news of this miracle quickly spread throughout the, throughout the town. And that evening the whole town gathered where Jesus was and they brought those who were sick, those who had uh, possessed, were possessed by demons or spirits and Jesus healed them all. This was amazing. And of course, you can imagine 
his fame and, and, and the stories of his deeds and exploits and teaching spread throughout that whole country around the Galilee. And then turning to chapter 2 of Mark in verse 1, it says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door, and he preached the word to them. So he went about teaching and healing and, and delivering people, and his fame spread abroad, abroad through that whole region of Galilee. And he returned to the, his house, which I assume is the house where he was living in Capernaum, because the scripture said in Mark Matthew that he, he lived there. And people heard that he was back. It became known amongst the town that this, this man, Jesus, this, this, this prophet of God, he's back in town. So and people began to flock to the house. And they were so many of them that you couldn't get near the place. It was just completely full of people who, were, who were, wanted to hear his teaching and, and, and wanted to, to know more. And then in verse 3, we find that there was four people who had a friend who was paralytic. He was paralyzed. And they, of course, had no chance to get him near Jesus. But Jesus was well known for healing people of all sorts of afflictions. So they thought this is an opportunity. Well, I'm surmising they thought this is an opportunity for our friend who's paralyzed to be healed. So they got, got him and brought him to the house where, to, give, to give them an opportunity for him to be healed by Jesus. Well, there was no chance of them getting to, into the house because there were so many people. His, he, the, the, the stories of, he, of he, what he had done would attracted so many people, such a crowd that they thronged around and it was completely no chance of getting near the door, never mind, into the house and into the presence of Jesus. Well, verse 3 of Mark chapter 2 says, they, they came, to, these four people came to Jesus bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So, so what happened was these men took their friend to the house where Jesus was. But when they got there, they couldn't get near the place. So they decided to go and uncover the roof. In other words, to break through the roof. And they, in, in um, Israel at that time, most of the houses were flat roof and they consisted of, of rafters with mats on top and then, and then a mud or adobe kind of covering layer to seal it and make it waterproof. And usually there was um, stairs on the outside of the house because people did go to the roof in the cool of the evening and so on. And these men carried their friend up onto the roof of the house and they began to, to break through the roof. Because when they arrived, the crowd was wrapped around the house they were not going to get anywhere near Jesus, but the di disappointment that they felt of that didn't stop them. They were determined to get their friend to, into the presence of Jesus to, to, so he could be healed. But they didn't let setback or, 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 or dis, you know, uh, difficulties stop them from their purpose. So they, they went up the side of the house and they began to break through. And you can imagine what it would have been like because... With that, a, that hard mud, the adobe kind of finish and, the, and the, the mats, they would have made quite a lot of noise. And I can also imagine those inside the house would have heard them, looked up and there would, would have been bits of roofing and mats and it all coming down as they broke through. And they, there would have been a lot of noise, would have been a lot of, of um, um, excitement and movement and things happening. People would have been aware of it. And finally, though, they made a... a, a a, ha a hole large enough for them to lower their friend. And they lowered their paralytic friend down through the roof and laid him right in front of Jesus. And then Mark chapter 2, verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Well, clearly, these four men who carried the paral paralyzed person there had great faith. And the, the, they didn't let... Um, inconvenience or difficulty stopped them. They were determined. They knew that, that if they could get their friend into the presence of Jesus, he could be healed. It could change his life. And they were determined to get him there. They didn't let um, these setbacks stop them. And they did what they could to get their friend in front of him. 
And it's interesting that it wasn't through the faith of the paralyzed man that Jesus said it was through their faith, that through the faith of the people that carried their friend into the presence of Jesus. So that tells us that even, even someone who's sick who doesn't have the faith to believe in healing, we can believe, supply the faith because God responds to faith and it can be supplied by the friends, not just the, the sick person. Anyway, when Jesus saw their faith, he didn't immediately heal their friend. He did something altogether unexpected. He said, son, your sins are forgiven you. So he didn't, as he had done with, with uh, Peter's mother-in-law, he didn't touch or take a hand or, or, or said, you are healed, rise up and walk. He said, no, no, he said, your sins are forgiven you. The man hadn't been brought to Jesus' presence by his friends for forgiveness. They brought him there to be healed. We, don't, we can't know what was going on in the paralysed man's heart. We don't know anything else about him except that he was paralysed and his friends were desperate to get him into the presence of Jesus for his healing. But Jesus' action here, when, he, when he, he didn't immediately heal him, he just said, your sins are forgiven you. And this shows us the most important need, the greatest need in people's life isn't, isn't physical healing at all. It's spiritual healing. And the man had been bound to his bed. He'd been unable to walk for a long time. But his need to be right with God was much greater than his need to be able to walk. It far exceeded it in, in importance. He could be, have stayed paralysed, but if his sins were forgiven, that was still more valuable than being able to walk. What could he have gained if he was healed physically but lived and died unforgiven? What point would there be to his healing if his sins weren't forgiven and he was still separated from God? He still had a, had a, had a gap uh, between him and his maker. Jesus said, what, what, would a man, what would a man gain if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? This his man's soul was worth so much more than his body. And Jesus didn't immediately heal him. He said, your sins are forgiven. Well, in the crowd at that time were some scribes. And we mentioned them um, in verse 22 of chapter 1, I think it was, where, where they said, when Jesus taught, they said, he's not like the scribes. He's talked as one as having authority. And the scribes were, were scholars of the Old Testament law. They were, they, um, they were learned teachers. They were authoritative. They, 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 were lead, they, they taught people um, how, to, how to apply the law to your daily life. And they, they were also involved in drawing up legal documents, they um, devoted themselves to the study of the law. They copied the Old Testament scriptures down. So they were religious folk and they were learned folk, but they weren't, uh, they weren't rabbis. They didn't have authority. They were the ones who, who instructed people in the ways of the law and the ways of God. So they did have, have um, a lot of knowledge and, and they did um, have the role of teaching people and but the, the, the people when Jesus taught recognised the difference between them and this man, Jesus, who spoke as though he had the authority in this thing. He was not just interpreting scripture. He was giving scripture. He was different. And there were, in this crowd, in this crowded house, were, were some scribes when Jesus was teaching. They were obviously there to hear what he had to say. And in Mark chapter 2, verse 6, it says, Some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they were correct. They were in the crowd to hear Jesus teaching. Who knows if they were there to, um, to, to crit give a criticism or critique of what he was saying, try to catch him in something wrong. Who knows why they were there, but they were there. And we know that following this time, there was often, um, the, the scribes were often the one who, who tried to, destroyed Jesus' ministry and, and caused him to be arrested. But they were, this, these scribes in, in this 
house on that day, they were correct. They said, who can forgive sins but God alone? And, and this man, Jesus, just said to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven. He has no authority to do that. Only God can forgive sins. And they were quite correct. Only God can forgive sins. And yet here was this man, Jesus, claiming that he had that authority. Well, in Mark chapter 2, verse 8, I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? So let's go, let's recap this story. These four men wanted their, their friend who was paralyzed to be healed so badly. And they, they had faith that if they could get him into the presence of Jesus, he could be healed. And when they got there, the crowd prevented them. But that didn't let a setback stop them. They didn't let a setback stop them. They climbed up on the roof, broke through the roof, lowered him into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. And Jesus said to the, to the scholars, the, to the scribes who were there, why are you thinking that I'm blaspheming? Is it easier for me to say to someone, your sins are forgiven you, or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? And he's saying, they are, which, which is easier to, to, for, to forgive a sins or cause a man to walk? And the, and the obvious answer is, we can't do either. Man can't do either of those things. We can't say to him, pick up your mat and walk and see him walk. Neither can we say to him, your sins are forgiven because that's beyond the power of man. Only God can do that. Well, in verse 10, Jesus said, I'm going to prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. He pointed out that, that both of these things, healing someone, healing this man, and forgiving his sins are both beyond the ability of men. So he said, I'm going to show you that I have the ability to forgive sins by showing you that I can heal this man. And so he turned to the paralyzed man. He said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. And these onlookers, they were amazed. They were amazed. And they, they, but they praised God because of this. They exclaimed, we've never seen anything like this before. They weren't, they weren't praising the man Jesus. They were praising God. In this amazing miracle, we see that Jesus was not just a man, but he was God revealed in the flesh. And that's what he said to the scribes. He said that... By healing this man, I'm proving to you that I have also have the authority to forgive his sins. Scripture reveals that, the, that Jesus was God, the deity of Christ, in two ways. By direct statement, saying that Jesus was God in the flesh, but also in, in examples of, like this of Jesus doing things and saying things that only God can do or could say. And this is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was setting the scene and showing that he was God in flesh, that he was able, that he had the authority to not just heal people, but to also forgive sins. And in this example of this healing of this paralyzed man, we see Jesus doing and saying something that only God could do or say. And if Jesus had just healed the man, perhaps we could say that doesn't prove anything because God can... Sometimes use us in healing. We can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But that doesn't mean that we are God. And that's, that happens in our time. It doesn't mean that we're divine. But Jesus said to the, to, to the scribes, he said, which is easier for me to forgive his sins or, or to heal him? And I'm going to heal him to show you that I can forgive sins. If he used this healing to confirm his deity. The man's physical healing helped prove his spiritual healing. His being able to stand up and walk proved that his sins had been forgiven by Jesus. Jesus has the power to forgive, not as a man, but as God in flesh. And that's the point, I think, of this story. We just talk, see the, the ability of Jesus to heal. But more than that, it shows us who he is, God manifest in the flesh. It shows 
that he has the authority to forgive, which is the title of this lesson. He just doesn't um, uh, have the power to heal. He actually has the authority to forgive us our trespasses. Physical healing is possible through Jesus Christ still today. And we should pray for people to be healed in their bodies. But more important, our number one priority should be for people to receive spiritual healing, to be reconciled to God, to have their sins forgiven, that they may have a, become a child of God and have a relationship with him and be part of his family. And through this story, we get a glimpse right near the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he just wasn't a man, he was God in flesh. And he's used this physical healing as a proof that he had the authority to forgive sins. By miraculously showing he had the authority to forgive sins, he revealed he was no mere man, but he was God in flesh. And therefore, his offer of salvation and forgiveness to us is true and powerful. When we are healed physically, we give glory to God. That's wonderful. But when we're not healed physically, we still give glory to God because he's God and, and, and his will be done. But above all, we need to be thankful that our sins have been forgiven. His death on the cross purchased our salvation. His death on the cross paid the price that our sins could be forgiven that we could be reconciled to God, that it tore down that barrier that was between us and God, that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And that is more precious and valuable and powerful than any physical healing. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and he's offered that to you and to me. And it's the most important thing that we can, we can have in our lives is to have our sins forgiven. And when we read this story, we tend to see ourselves in the role of the paralysed man. The one who needs healing, who had to be carried and placed at the feet of Jesus to receive his healing. But we should also seek, I think, the role of the friends. The ones who supplied the faith that this paralysed man could have his sins forgiven and he could be healed. It was through their efforts that he received his healing. It was through the efforts that he was brought into the presence of Jesus. And he would have remained as he was, unhealed and unforgiven, if it wasn't for those four friends who brought him into his presence. And we should not just identify with the one who needs healing. We should identify and seek to carry the role of the four friends who supplied the faith and to carry those who need healing into the presence of Jesus. I remember um, a, a sermon many years ago preached by a man um, um, at a minister's retreat, uh, we carry those we cannot heal, about the, the man who, who was laid at the, the temple at the Gate Beautiful where he would beg for alms and one day Peter and John said, we haven't got any silver and gold, but such as we have, we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he was instantly healed even though he'd been lame from his birth. And he went into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. But he couldn't get to the, temp, to the gate beautiful at the temple on his own. Someone had to take him there. They had to be carried there by his family or by his friends. And they got him as close as they could to the presence of God, as close as they could to the temple until the day that he met God for himself and his healing occurred. And that's the role this story, I think, is teaching us. He wants us to bring others to him. And it might be inconvenient, there might be a crowd, there might be a crush, there might be no easy way through. It might be require us to do things that we're not inclined to do. I don't think those four men were inclined to go onto roofs and dig holes into roofs. But the, the, the need of their friend overrode their comfort and their convenience. And they supplied the faith that he could be healed and forgiven. Over the next three weeks, I think it is, of this study, we're going to look at Jesus, that Jesus wants us to, 
to come to him for forgiveness and healing, that he is able to forgive, that it's his desire that all should come to repentance, that, that, that none should perish. But in this first lesson, we want to, to emphasise that Jesus has that authority. He's not just a man, he's God in flesh. He was sent to seek and to save the lost. That was his purpose. And if we can bring those who need healing into his presence, he will heal them. But far more than the healing their physical body, he can heal them spiritually. He can forgive their sins and he can bring them into relationship with himself. So that is our desire above all. So when you go through this story again, don't think about yourself as a paralysed man. Put yourself in the place of his friends who carried him. And let's pray together that we have the opportunity to bring someone into his presence in the coming week. Let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We're so thankful, oh God, for, to, that we know you, that you have forgiven us, oh God, that you have drawn us as we, into your presence, Lord God, that you have taken our sins from us and that we can walk in newness of life, that through, Lord God, your sacrifice on the cross, Lord, the price was paid that we could be released from the punishment that we deserved. And you have, Lord, Lord, washed our sins away in baptism, oh God, and that, that, that you have, we have risen to newness of life with your, with your Holy Spirit, Lord, dwelling in us. And we're so thankful, oh God, and we pray in Jesus' name that you'd help us, Lord God, to have the faith to bring our friends, our family, Lord, those we meet into your presence, Lord God, to carry them, Lord, to where we know salvation lies, and that's with you. And we pray, oh God, give us faith, Lord God, let our faith increase. And as we bring people before your throne, we know you will hear our prayer and hear their prayer, oh God. And you will respond to that faith. And we're so thankful that you've entrusted us with this sacred task. Lord, we ask your, your help and your strength and your presence in our life as we go about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.